Okay, that's why it's good to do these quizzes. All right, Mike asked me if I would talk a little bit about right-of-way surveys. Well, we won't take very long. I'm just going to kind of give you a high-level overview today. So, it, it was a good it was a good topic suggestion um, because right-of-way surveys are really different. They're like other boundary surveys, but different in some very important ways. Let me put it that way. So. Uh, the first 15 years, no, not, I guess not, 12, first 12 years I did surveys, this is basically all I did. So I didn't even really get to be a real boundary surveyor until I went to, o until I went to Odell. So I want to explain the differences. So the main difference between a, a, what I call a site development survey or a lot survey and a right-of-way survey is in a right-of-way survey, you don't necessarily fully resolve all the parcel boundaries. If we're doing a site development survey or a lot survey, we're going to fully resolve those boundaries. And I'm going to explain why we don't do that on a right-of-way survey. But before we get into that, let's just go over kind of the high level. What are some things that a land surveyor, like what's the services that we would offer on a right-of-way project? So you're going to build a highway or a pipeline or a canal or something, okay, so um, we might help with route selection, okay, that's usually an engineering thing, but it might be a surveying thing, sometimes we come in, we could also call this route planning, we might come in and help the engineer look at right-of-way impacts, so we might like put together some GIS data and some tax assessor data and locate some buildings because What's one of the main cost drivers on a right-of-way project, a road, a road, a corridor project? One of the main cost drivers is what? Yeah, yeah right-of-way. So depending on where you put the road, like if you can miss the warehouse or the truck stop with your route, you're going to way reduce the cost of your right-of-way. So sometimes we get involved helping the engineers figure out the route selection and route planning just based on the right-of-way costs. Okay. So uh, we don't always have a role in that, but we do. Sometimes it gets really scary. I've, I've worked for some utility companies where you got to be careful because you're, you're helping them with the route selection from a right-of-way perspective, and they end up pushing you to do some of the design work. You know, you're looking at slopes and drainage, and you got to be careful if you're an L, if you're a land surveyor that you're not practicing out, practicing civil engineering. So the main driver besides right-of-way cost, the next biggest driver is usually uh, uh, structures. Uh, and primarily bridges. So that's the other thing, like the longer the bridge, the more bridges and the longer the bridges, the more expensive that project gets. So you try to avoid that. Then we usually, uh, we do what I call design surveys, okay, which is boundary topo. Okay, another big difference between site development surveys and right-of-way surveys is, unless you're in an urban area, Almost all the time, that 90% of the time when you're doing a big corridor project, what kind of topo are you going to have? Aerial. An aerial. You're going to have an aerial. And you might tie some hardscape out in key locations, but you're probably using an aerial because you're trying to cover a lot of ground. Even if, even on like a county road project or a highway project where you just have a two-lane paved road, that's going to be an aerial. Almost, almost certainly. Okay, the boundary survey on that, what we usually put together, I'm going to just do a little side note here. This is what Caltrans calls a land net. Okay. Uh, GISers will call this a parcel fabric sometimes. Okay, and it's just the existing parcels, the net, the network or the fabric of existing parcels. Okay, you guys hear me joke a lot of times about Caltrans, but they really are the best in the world at this right away surveys. If you read their manuals, they have they have a very well defined, they have an excellent process for right away surveys. Caltrans right away manual. It's it's the best way to do this type of project. Having said that, I think the guys at Caltrans get a little anal on some stuff. They get a little tight, um, so they make projects more expensive than they need to be. Uh, but they have a very thorough process. Caltrans does not mess stuff up on right away surveys as a general rule. Um, and how do you think it is? Why do you think it is that they have have that well defined process? They probably messed up. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, because they mess up and it caught, they get sued. So they have a very, very good pro. Like, 
very good process. So, uh, so you put together the land net. Okay, then they usually have, uh, we usually end up helping them what we call the acquisition phase. Okay, which is going to buy the right away. So we do, usually we do appraisal maps, right away staking, plats and legals for the acquisitions. If they go to condemnation, they've got what they call resolution of necessity documents in California, which is basically special exhibits that they use to go to court to take the property. So those are kind of the three basic phases that we're involved in. Okay, now let's go back in. So the main chunk of this for us is usually the land net. Um, it's not that the topo isn't, the topo can be a big piece, but usually the, usually the land net is more on a dollar value basis because we're usually doing the topo with an aerial. Uh, on the topo, if you're thinking about your typical road or highway project, um, what can you not do with the aerial on the topo? What do you got to you got to get out your laser scanner, your tool station for what? If you're thinking about your typical highway project, surface design. Uh, no. That you, uh, that's kind of a I don't know. I'm gonna say no. What can you not get on the aerial? It's it's not accurate enough, and you're not gonna see it. The aerial's top down. What are you not gonna see? Jesse, what would you scan on a transportation project? Transportation survey. Curves, gutters, uh, medium, and vertical. Okay, so yeah, some of your hardscape. So that would be good. A lot, a lot of times you'll, you'll leave, they'll even try and work with that off the aerial, uh, depending on what they're doing. But I was thinking structures, right? So anytime you got a bridge, can you do that with an aerial? Got it, right? You can't even see it from an aerial. So you got to have. Usually we're doing now, now. Any time I did a transportation project that, with a bridge that was going to get touched, what would we do? How would we survey that here? Yeah. We would only scan that, right? We wouldn't do it any other way. All right, let's talk about the land net for a minute. So here's what's a little bit different. So let's say in this example, we've got these two roads. You see this a lot, two county roads coming in, right? And engineers really don't like these intersections, these kind of intersections. Why do they not like them? Hazard. Yeah, why are they having this? Left side. Yeah, they're not at right angles. Yeah, engineers like intersections at right angles. So you can imagine if I pull up here in my Dodge Ram, and there's, let's say there's a little hedgerow here, right? To see traffic coming this way, what do I got to do? You see how far I got to turn my neck to see un 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 the traffic coming this way? So engineers don't like these. So what they like to do, and you'll see where they do this, is they'll come in, and they'll swing this out and they'll 90 it in. Okay, same thing on the other side. They did this at uh, French Camp Road near I-5. They did this. Okay, so we know they come up with a design. So here's part of what part of what surveyors help with in that kind of that route planning phase. And I guess it could even be farther along. It could even be after you've selected the route. The engineer comes up with where they want the new thing canal or road or whatever it is. Okay, then usually what needs to happen is the surveyor has to take that thing and we got to come up with a new footprint. I call it a right-of-way footprint. Okay? Now, occasionally engineers will try and do that. Should they? Come up with their own right-of-way footprint. No, they should not do that. That's a surveyor thing. So, they give you the footprint of the physical improvements and then you have to start asking questions as a surveyor like, how much room do you need for maintenance? What about what if this uh, what if this guy's got a house here, um, you know, and now you're moving the road? How's he going to maintain his access? What if we're what if we don't want him having access to a certain part? You know, like are we going to want this guy to have a driveway right here? Too close to the intersection, probably, right? So maybe he needs a maybe now he needs an access easement over somebody else's property to get down here, right? All those kinds of things you got to think about when you develop a right-of-way footprint. So usually we tell the engineer, give us a design footprint, we will come up with a right-of-way footprint. Now, when you're doing, when you're working on a Caltrans project, they have something called, I forget what it's called. I'm going to try and think of what it's called. Uh, it's like a call, they call it a right-of-way certification, which is basically the surveyor and engineer on the project certify that the right-of-way footprint is sufficient for the physical improvement. 
because if you're not careful, what happens? You spend all this money to get right away for your job, and then, and then what do you find out later? Your physical stuff doesn't fit inside the new right away. That's no bueno, right? Okay, so we know where this footprint is that the engineer wants, okay? Now that's based on some topo survey that we did that we nailed on the ground. So is there any confusion about where these orange lines need to be on the surface of the earth if we've done a good topo? No, we know exactly, we can, can we walk to this line right here? Absolutely, yes, we can. In most cases, in most designs, we can do that. Okay, what's the problem with the purple lines? The parcel lines? Probably buildings built off of Well, yeah, but so, let me, let me rephrase that question. Which line can we locate more exactly, the purple line or the orange line? If the purple lines are existing parcels. It's not existing, right? It is. It, no, but these are parcel lines. These are just fee parcels. Which can we which can we locate more exactly? The orange or the purple? The orange. The orange. We can locate the orange more exactly. We know exactly where that's at on the ground per per a design. Per two physical mon you know, from a physical set of monuments that we set in the ground, we can walk to that orange line. What's the problem with knowing exactly where the purple line is? Yeah, interpreting deeds, conflicting corners, you know, uh, maps that you can't read. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons why the purple lines are hard. That's why we get paid to do what we do. Okay, so here's the thing. I'm going to change examples for a minute. Let's say that they're going to come in and uh, not only are they going to realign this intersection, but they're going to come in here and they're going to take another 20 feet. Let's say we got a center line mod here and here. Do I need to know where all these individual side lot lines are to know where this pink line is that I want to take? No. No. So here, here's how right away surveys work. And this includes surveys that are done by Caltrans. Caltrans is not going to go in and pay to survey, fully resolve the boundary of every one of these lots. Nor should they have to. Right? Because what does Caltrans want to do? Then we're going to go back to the old Will Paul statement. Know what your client's trying to do. What's our client trying to do here? What's the end goal? Putting the hole in the road. Widen the road. Right here, right? We're talking about the pink line. Yeah. The goal is to widen the road. Do they want to have to survey everybody's lot along here? No. No. That cost of, what's it cost to survey a lot, gentlemen? Fully resolve. What's the cheapest we can fully resolve a a lot here. I don't know, it's a few thousand dollars at least, right? So if you're doing two miles of road and you got 20 parcels times eight grand a parcel, what is that? It's $160,000, right? And that number's probably low. So here's what Caltrans will do. They have to set any corners? And not just Caltrans, no, they don't have to set any corners. Now if you're a smart landowner, when they come to take your right away, what do you tell them? Pay this up. Especially if you've already got corners here that are coming out. Yeah. yeah, if you're a smart landowner, you say, yeah, you can have that 20 feet. You're going to pay me for it. You're also going to set those two corners. How many landowners are that smart? One of the thousand. Yeah, like the ones that used to be surveyors. Yeah. Right? Okay, so here's how Cat Trans will do it. They'll come in here and they'll write a description. I kid you not, this is how they read. They'll say, starting at this monument. Ending at that one. And then let's say this is a 40-foot strip. So we got 20 and 20. 20. They'll say a 20 foot strip starting here, running down a thousand feet to this monument. Okay? They'll say a strip line 40 feet on the north side of that line, let's say. Okay, now, what they do on each one of these parcels, let's just letter them A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. Here's how each of these deeds read. So each one of these gets a deed. It's either you sell them, the landowner sells, or they go to condemnation and the judge gives it to you, but there's always a deed. And here's what the deed says. All that portion of parcel G inside this strip. All that portion of parcel F inside this strip. All that portion of parcel E inside this strip. Strip. I don't charge extra for sound effects. Right? So, do you understand when we write the when we write the takes that way? Do we? Does it matter if this little line moves a couple feet? 
we're going to have whatever's in the peak strip. This peak strip, which is what we want. And that's how Caltrans will write the right-of-way deeds. In fact, you notice here on H, I, I, I ran this out to center line. I didn't stop at the purple. They'll do that. They'll overshoot just to be safe, right? So now if I said whatever part of G is in the, in the peak strip, even if some other surveyor comes here and moves this line of G out a little bit, we're still covered, right? That's how you do right-of-way surveys. Now, let me tell you the problem with this method because there's no free lunch in life, right? So what that doesn't tell you, if you don't know for sure where these purple lines are, creates a problem when you go to acquire the land. Now you can even, we can even stake this. We come out and we put these stakes, put these stakes in so the landowner can see what we're taking. Okay, but here's what you can't say with confidence if you haven't resolved all these lines. How many square foot is that? We don't know. So the problem with this method is you can only you only get approximate areas of the takes. If you want exact areas of the takes, you got to nail those lines down. And they're paying per square foot and you don't know the area. Okay, so I'm going to explain how that works. If you're widening I-80 in downtown San Francisco, guess what you do with all these purple lines? You find out where they're at. Yeah. Why? Well, it's not just zero setback, although that's a good, yeah, it's not just that, but how we, you said it, Mike, how are we paying for the dirt? What's the dirt per square foot in I-80 by in San Francisco? Ridiculously expensive. So is 100 square feet going to matter? Yeah. So you got to find those purple lines, usually. Now, if you're out in Ripon, if you're headed outside of Ripon on Jack Tone Road, San Joaquin County, what's... An, an extra 100 or 200 square feet, how's that going to change the price of that tape? It costs more to survey it. You're better off to give the landowner the extra money that you pay to get the survey done. Like, everybody will be happier. So what I tell the county, what I tell public agencies, is usually counties, but it could be cities, when you're working in a rural area like this, and you're using this method, you know, if, if you think you might be off 200 square feet or 500 square feet or 1,000 square feet on your take, you just pay them the extra. You're better off. Just give the landowner the money and, and get your tape. Okay, so you still have to do some boundary surveying. You need to find these center line lawns so you can define that pink strip. And you need to have a rough idea where these lines are, the purple lines. You need a rough idea. You got to know who you're buying property from, right? And so what we normally do on a job like this is we'll tie out these center line lawns or section corners or quarter corners, whatever. And then we just go in and we nail down anything that's got a map where we can find monuments. Any of these parcels that are on a parcel map or a record survey or a track map, we tie them on and nail them down. If those parcels are by D, we don't mess with them usually. Like We'll put them in the best we can per record, but we don't resolve them because we don't need to to get the take. All we're after is the take. Okay. Now let me give you another exception of where you might get in trouble. You got to know what you're doing with this or, or, or you, you can get into trouble. So I'm going to show you an example. How much is exempt from ROS two? Uh, yeah, the, the, basically the law says if a public agency can follow the law and it's not an undue burden, they should do it. But that's open to some interpretation. Okay, so let's just say we have something like this, where we've got a parcel that comes in like this. What's the problem now with the pink method? What I'm calling the pink method, the strip, the strip method of description. What's the problem with that purple line I just drew? This is parcel H now. If it crooks down a little bit, then you got to yeah. center center. So what do you got to do with this guy? This this one oh, out of this whole thing, what's the one purple line we got to locate? H. We got to locate that line now because we might have a take there and we don't know, right? Or you just pay H some money, <laughs> right? And you say whatever of H is in this peak strip, but you got to as a surveyor, you got to be looking for this. Right? How close is this to my line, right? And there's some safety factor there, right? And we can answer this as a survey, surveyor, right? Like if we think we can get that within a foot, then we probably don't need to worry about age. If we're like, man, I might be plus or minus 15 feet on that line based on the record, then yeah, you better freaking figure it out because you might have a take there. What you don't want to do is build your road and then find out later some surveyor comes in and does a record survey and he puts your line down like this, right? 
and like there's a bridge column here because this is a creek. Okay, you really don't want to find out that you don't have a deed that covers your bridge column. There's no bueno. So you got to look for that kind of stuff, right? I'll tell you. I'll give you one quick example of another thing you just would never think about, and it burned me. It, it didn't burn me on a project, but I missed it on a project, and, and we caught it because the real property team had their crap together. I was working on a project. I'll give you. I'll give you an example. This this project had two things that caught me by surprise. We'll do, and Mike, we'll do some more if you remind me. We can do some 30-minute classes on each of those three areas and walk through more of the process. But so we had a new road we're building. This is this is not on an existing route. It's just cutting across brand new country. And right here, it crossed a slough. And right here, across the railroad. And I didn't think about it when we put, first put together the land net. What problem do you think I ran into right here? So I had parcel A over here and I had parcel B over here. What, do you, what problem do you think I had in the hatched area? Change. Okay, so I get a deed from A and I get a deed from B. What do I got to put over the slough if I'm building a road? A bridge? Look, the description for B goes to the edge of the water and the description for A goes to the edge of the water. What's the problem I got? You, know, you can't look the other side because it goes in the road. Well, it goes to this edge of water. B goes to here and A goes to here. What's the problem I got? Oh, the lines. You know, you got the gap between A and B. I got an ownership gap. I'm going to build a bridge there. I got it. S somebody owns that even though it's not in those two deeds, and I missed it. I just totally spaced it. Now, if that's navigable, which is a whole other legal term we won't talk about today, but if it's navigable, basically if you can float a boat down it, then the state owns it. And guess what Guess who you gotta go, guess what you gotta go get? Because the state's not gonna give you, they're not gonna sell you that. And they won't even give you an easement over it because they're the state, but they'll give you a license to put a bridge on top for however many years. 99 years or whatever. Like a lease or yeah, it's like a lease. But you got to go get permission to put your bridge up. Now, in this particular case, I was in a Spanish land grant, and you know who owns the bed of navigable rivers in a Spanish land grant? No, the upland owner. The what? The upland owner. Oh. <coughs> They're privately owned. Beds of navigable rivers are privately owned under Mexican law. Okay. So. When they deeded these parcels out, they deeded A and they deeded B, and they forgot the river. So I had to go back and find the guy that originally owned A and B on each side, because when he sold when he sold those out, he forgot this, he forgot the bed of the river. He still owned the bed of the river. And if you went and look, here's the here's why I should have been fired. If you went in and looked at the tax assessor map, this bed of the river had an APN number. Now there was no deed for it. But somebody at the assessor's office was smart enough to know that that was privately owned. Okay, and I missed that one. So it's Stanislaus? So you can own the channel, but you can't own the water. You don't own the water, but you own the bed of the river. Yeah, and if an island forms in the bed in the river, that's yours. That's your island. Yeah. Crazy. Okay, so over here I had a railroad. Okay, and here's what I didn't realize: this railroad was like a hundred feet wide. This was a public road over here, so this is a street. And then there was another 100 foot strip right here. This is in Stockton, by the way. I drive by this every day. There's another 100 foot strip right here that for 200 years, everybody has assumed was owned by the railroad because it's vacant land and it runs right by the tracks. And guess what? The railroad doesn't own that. And you know how I know? Because I called them and asked them. So same thing, if I'm building a road, what am I doing over the railroad? Putting in a bridge. So I had three bridge columns going right here to get over the track. So who did I, what did I need to know? Right here. Who owned that? 
I never did find the owner on that. So the city come up with some pokey pokey half-baked legal solution. I'm not even going to tell you about because it, it was wrong. <laughs> but my point is, why do we not let engineers do this? Because sometimes we can't even do it. Yeah, because it's hard and sometimes even we screw it up. Like you're like, oh yeah, we need a road. No big deal. We'll pull the assessor's plow. We'll figure out who we got to pay. Yeah, it's not that easy. It's frequently not that easy. There's tricky stuff. So I call these, these, these areas right here, I call no man's land, right? Claimed by no man. But you can't just build stuff in America. It's like, <laughs> you gotta come up with, now the right way I think for the city to have done this, they didn't do this. I told them this is how you need to do it, and then they didn't, they didn't listen. But you quiet title to that. You go to court and you say, hey, we can't find the owner. The railroad doesn't claim it, and we need to build a bridge, your honor. Can you please grant us this strip of land? And the judge will say, yep, it's yours if nobody contests that, right? And even if they did contest it, that's what you want because you're trying to identify an owner. And there's a whole, there's a public note, you gotta put the notice in the paper and send a letter to the adjoiners and there's a whole process you go through with a land attorney, but that's the right way to clean that up. And now on this one, they found the owner because we can run the chain of title and figure out who owned it. There's probably, he was probably long gone though, right? So it's like a yeah, we found his heirs. So, so uh, do you know who originally owned the Spanish land grant that holds Stockton? Charles M. Weber, okay? We literally found the heirs of Charles M. Weber. They live in Sacramento. And the city of Stockton went up there and cut him a $10,000 check. Hmm. It's like, how'd you like to have some guy show up at your doorstep one day and be like, yeah, you're the great, great grandson of Charles M. Weber and here's a check for $10,000 we need to build a bridge over your sloop. Pretty crazy, huh? So, I, I there's rarely a right-of-way project where I don't run into some funky thing like this somewhere. So, all right, we'll do some more on right-of-way service. No one to forget, Mike. Yep. Thank you for coming to class. Who won the quiz? I mean, oh yeah, who won? What's your scores? I didn't do very well. What'd you get, Mike? 